The Jade Peony, short story by Wayson Choi. When Grandma died at 83, our whole household held its breath. She had promised us a sign of her leaving, final proof that her present life had ended well. My parents knew that without any clear sign, our own family fortunes could have been altered, threatened. My stepmother looked endlessly into the small cluttered room with the, the ancient lady had occupied. Nothing was touched, nothing changed. My father, thinking that a sign should appear in Grandma's garden, looked at the frost, killed shoots, and cringed. No, that could not be it. My two older bro teenage brothers and my sister, Liang, age 14, were embarrassed by my parents' behavior. What would all the white people in Vancouver think of us? We are Canadians now, Chinese Canadians, a hyphenated reality that my parents could never accept. So it seems for different reasons, we all held our breath waiting for something. I was eight when she died. Four days she had resisted going into the hospital, a cold, just a cold, and instead gave constant instruction to my stepmother and sister on the boiling of ginseng roots mixed with bitter extract. At night, between the racking coughs and the deadly silences, Grandma had her back and chest rubbed with a heated camphor oil and sipped a bluish de deconcoction of herb called Peacock's Tail. When these, when these failed to abate her fever, she began to arrange the details of her will. This did with, the, with my father, confessingly, finally, I am too stubborn. The only cure for old age is to die. My father wept to hear this. I stood beside her bed and she turned to me. Her round face looked darker and her gentleness of her eyes, the thin arch eyebrows seemed weary. I brushed the few strands of the gray brittle hair from her face. She managed to smile at me. Being the youngest, I had spent nearly all my life with her and, I, and could not imagine that we would ever be parted. Yet when she spoke and her voice hesitated, cracked, the somber shadows of the room chilled me. Her wrinkled brow grew wet with fever, and her small body seemed to even more diminutive. I, I'm going to the hospital, grandson. Her hand reached out for mine. You know, little son, whatever happens, I will never leave you. Her, her palm felt plush and warm, the slender old fingers bony and firm, so magically strong that it was her grip that I could not imagine how she could ever part from me, ever. Her hands were magical, the most vivid memories are of her hands. Long, elegant fingers with the impeccable nails, the skin of fine, barely seen veins, and wrinkled skin like pine. Those hands were quick when she taught me, at six, simple tricks of juggling, learnt when she was a village girl in southern Canton. A troop of actors had stayed, with, stayed on her father's farm, one of them, tall and pale as the whiteness of petals, fell in love with her, promising to return. In her last years, his image came back like a third being in our two lives. He had been a magician, acrobat, juggler, and some of the things that he taught her, she had absorbed and passed on to me through her stories and games. But above all, without realizing it then, her hands conveyed to me the quality of their love. Most marvelous for me was the quick-witted skill of her hands revealed in making wind chimes for our birthdays, Wind chimes in the likeness of her lost friends only present to her made of bits of string and scraps in the center of which once hung, hung a precious jade peony. This wondrous gift to her broke apart years ago in China, but Grandma kept the jade pendant in a tiny red silk envelope and it always and kept it always in her pocket until her death. These were not ordinary, careless made chimes, just as you know, just as those you now find in our Chinatown stores. Those rattling noises drive you mad. But making her special ones caused dissension in our family and some shame. Each one that she made was created from a treasure trove of glass fragments and castaway costume jewelry, in the same way that her first wind chime had been made. The problem for the rest of the family was that the fact that Grandma looked for those treasures, wandering in the back alleys of Kiefer and Pender streets, peering into neighbors' garbage cans, chasing away hungry, nervous cats, and shouting curses at them. All our friends are laughing at us, old brother Jung said at, at last to my father when Grandma was away having tea at Mrs. Lim's. We are not poor, oldest brother 
Kiem declared. Yet she and Seklang poked through those awful things as if he shoved me in frustration and stumbled against my sister. They were beggars. She will make little brother crazy, Sister Lang said without warning. She punched me sharply in the back. I jumped. Look, you see, look how nervous he is. I lifted my foot slightly, enough to swing it back and kick Lang in the shin. She yelled and pulled back her fist to punch me again. Jung made a menacing move towards me. Stop this, all of you, my father shook his head with extreme, extreme exasperation. How, how could he dare tell old grand grand old one, his aging mother that that was somehow appropriate in a poor village in China was an abomination here. How could he prevent me, his youngest, from accompanying her? If she when she went walking into all those alleyways alone, could she well be attacked by hoodlums? She's not a beggar looking for food. She's searching for for my stepmother attempted to speak and fell silent. She, too, seemed perplexed and somewhat ashamed. They all loved Grandmama, but when she was inconvenient, unsettling, as far as our neighbors most understood Grandmama to be harmlessly crazy, others that she did not indeed make lovely toys, but for what purpose? Why? they asked, and the story she told me of the juggler who smiled at her flashed in my head. Finally, by the cutting remark that the family did exert enough pressure so that Grandmama and I could no longer openly announce our expeditions. Instead, she took me with her on our shopping trips, obstinately for clothes or groceries, while in fact we spent most of our time exploring stranger and more distant neighborhoods, searching for splendid junk, jangling pieces of vase, a cranberry glass fragments embossed with leaves, discarded glass beads from... Woolworth's necklaces. We would sneak them all home in brown rice sacks folded into small parcels and put them under her bed. During the day when the family was away at school or work, we bought them out and washed every item in a large black pot of boiling lye water and dried them quickly, carefully, and returned them, sparkling under her bed. Our greatest excitement occurred when the fire gutted the large Chinese Presbyterian church, three blocks from our house. The over still smoking ruins the next day, Grandmama and I rushed precariously over the blackened beams to pick out stained glass that glittered in the sunlight. Small figures bent over wrapped against the autumn cold in the dark blue quilted coat, happily gathering each piece like gold. She became my spiritual playmate. There's a good one, there. Hours later, soot covered and smelling of smoke, we came home with a grocery carton full of delicate fragments. Still early enough to steal them off into the house, and when she put them in a small box under her bed, these are special pieces, she said, giving a box a last push because they come from a sacred place. She slowly got up, and I saw for the first time her hand had began to shake. But then, in her joy, she embraced me. Both of all her hearts were racing as if she were, as if we were two dreamers. I buried my face in her blue quilt, and for a moment. The whole world seemed silent. My juggler, she said. He never came back from Hohan. Perhaps the famine. Her voice began to sh began to quake. But I shall have my sacred wind chime. I shall have it again. One evening when the family was gathered in their usual place in the parlor, Grandmama gave me a secret nod, a slight wink of her eye, and a flaring of her nostrils. It was the trouble in the air. Supper had gone badly. School examinations were due. Father had failed to meet the editorial deadline in the Vancouver Chinese Times. A huge sigh came from Sister Liang. But it is useless. This Chinese they teach you, she lamented, turning to the stepmother for support. Silence, Liang frowned, dejected, and went back to her Chinese book, bending the covers back. Father, the oldest brother, Kiam Vian, waving his bamboo brush in the air, you must realize that this Mandarin only confuses us. We are Cantonese speakers. And you do not complain about Latin, French, or German in your English school, Father rattled his newspaper, a signal that his patience was ending. But Father, those languages are scientific, said Kim, jabbed his brush in the air. We are now in a scientific, logical world. Father was silent. We could hear Grandmama's rocker. What's Siklung? Older brother Jung pointed angrily at me. 
He was sick last year, but this year he should have at least started Chinese school instead of picking over garbage cans. He starts next year, father said in a hard tone that immediately warned everyone to be silent. Lang slammed her book. Grandmama went on rocking and quietly in her chair. She complimented my mother on her knitting and made a remark about the strong beauty of Kiam's brushstrokes, which, in spite of himself, immensely pleased him. All this babbling noise was her family, torn and confused in a strange land. Everything here was so foreign and scientific. The truth was, I was sorry, not to have startled school the year before. In my innocence, I had imagined going to school meant certain privileges worthy of my brother's and sister's complaints. The fact that my lung infection in my fifth and sixth years, mistakenly diagnosed as TB, earned some reprieve and only made me long for school the more. Each member of my family took turns on Sunday teaching me or annoying me, but it was the countless hours I spent with my grandmama that were my real education. Tapping me on the head, she would say, Come, Siklong, we have our work, and we would walk up to the stairs to her small, crowded room. There in the midst of her antique shawls, the old and ancestral calligraphy and miscolored embroidered hangings beneath the mysterious shelves of sweet herbs and bitter potions, we would continue to do what we had started that morning. The elaborate wind chime came for her death. I can't last forever, she declared, and when she let me in on the secret of this one, it will sing and dance and glitter, and along her finger, and her long finger stretched into the air, pantomiming the waving motion of her ghost chimes. My spirit will hear its sound and it see its lights and return to this house and say goodbye to you. Deftly, she reached into the grocery carton she had placed on the chair beside me. She picked out a fish-shaped amber piece and with a long needle like a tool and a steel, steel ruler, she scored it. Pressing the blade of a cleaver against the line with the fingers on the other hand, she lifted up the glass until it cleanly snapped into the exact shape she required. Her hand began to tremble, the tips of her fingers shiver like rippling water. You see that, little one? She held up her hand. That is my body fighting with death. He is in his room now. My eyes darted in panic, but Grandmama remained calm, undisturbed, and with her, went on with her work. Then I remembered the glue and uncorked the jar for her. Soon the graceful ritual movements of her hand returned to her and I became the lost in the magic of her task. She dabbed a cannibalistic mixture of glue on one end and skillfully dropped the braided end of silk thread onto it. This part always amazes me. The braid would slowly, very slowly unknot, fanning out into a prized fishtail. In a few seconds, the clear homemade glue began to harden as it blew lightly over, welding itself to each separate silk strand. Each jam-sized pot of glue was precious. Each cork had been wrapped with fragments of silk, pink silk. I remember this part vividly because each cork was treated to a special rite. We, were, we first went shopping in the best silk stores in Chinatown for the perfect square of silk she required. It had to be a deep pink, a shade of color blushing toward red. And when the tone had matched when the tone had matched as closely as possible, her most precious jade carving, the small peony of white and light red jade, her most lucky possession. In the center of the semi-translucent carving, no more than two and a half centimeters wide, it was a pool of pink light, its veins swirling into the petals of the flower. This color is the color of my spirit, she said, holding it up to the window so I could see the delicate pastel against the broad strokes of sunlight. She dropped her voice and I held my breath at the wonder of the color. This was given to me by the youngest actor who taught me how to juggle. He had four of them. Each one had a center of this rare color, the color of good fortune. The pendant seemed to pulse as she turned it. Oh, Siklang, he had white hair and white skin to his toes. It's true, I saw him bathing. She laughed and blushed and her eyes softened at the memory. She had to match the pink heart of her pendant. The color was magical for her. To hold her unraveling strands in her memory. It was just six months before she died that we really began to work on her wind chime. Three thin bamboo sticks were steamed into, and bent into circles. Thirty exact lengths of silk threads, the strongest kind, were cut and braided at both ends and glued to the stained glass. Her hands worked on her own command each racing in, with a life of its own, cutting and snapping, braiding, nodding. Sometimes she breathed heavenly, 
heavily, heavily, and her small body growing thinner sagged against me. Death, I thought. He is in this room, and I would work harder alongside her. For months, Grandmama and I did this every other evening, a half a dozen pieces each time. The shaking in her hand grew worse, but we said nothing. Finally, after discarding hundreds, she told me that she had the necessary 30 pieces. But this time, because it was a sacred chime, I would not be permitted to help her tie or have the joy of raising it. Once tied, she said, holding against my disappointment, I cannot even raise it, not a sound it must make until I have died. What will happen? Your father will take it to the center, take the center braid strand and raise it. He will hang it against my bedroom window so that my ghost may see it and hear it and return. I must say goodbye to this world properly or wander in this foreign devil's land forever. You can take the streetcar, I blurred, suddenly shocked at the actual, what actually meant to leave me. I thought I could hear the, the clear chromatic chimes and see the shimmering colors on the wall. I fell against her and I cried and there in my crying, I knew that she would die. I can still remember the touch of her hand on my head, the smell of her thick woolen sweater pressed against my face. I'll always be with you, little Sing Lung. Sing Lung. But in a different way, you'll see. Months went by and nothing happened. And then one late September evening, when I had just come home from the Chinese school, Grandmama was preparing supper when she looked out our kitchen window and saw a cat, a long, lean white cat, jump into the garbage pail and knock it over. She ran to chase it away, shouting curses at it. She did not have a thick sweater on, and when she came back into the house, a chill gripped her. She leaned against the door. It was not a cat, she said. And the odd tone of her voice, my father looked at her with an alarm at her. I cannot take back my curses. It's too late. She took hold of my father's arm. It was all white and it had pink eyes like sacred fire. My father st started started at this and when they both looked pale my brothers and sisters clearing the table froze in their gestures the fog has confused you stepmother it was just a cat but grandmama shook her head and she knew it was a sign i will not live forever she said i am prepared the next morning she was confined to her bed with a severe cold sitting by her playing her with playing with some of my toys i asked her about the cat why did father jump at the cat with pink eyes i he didn't see it, did you? You did? But he and your mother know what it means. What? My friend, the juggler, the magician, was as pale as white jade, and he had pink eyes. I thought she, I th I thought she would begin to tell me one of her stories, a tale of enchantment or of wondrous adventure, but she only paused to swallow. Her eyes glittered, lost in memory. She took my hand, gently opening them, closing her fingers over it. Seek Lung, she sighed. He has come back to me. When Grandmama sank back into her pillow and the embroidered flowers lifted to, to frame her wrinkled face, I saw her hand over my own, and my own began to tremble. I felt fitful asleep by her side. When I awoke up, it was dark and her bed was empty. She had been taken to the hospital and I was not permitted to visit. A few days after that, she died of the complications of pneumonia. Immediately after her death, my father came home and said nothing to us, but I walked up the stairs to her room, pulled aside the drawn lace curtains of her window, and lifted the wind chimes to the sky. I began to cry quickly and put my hands in my pocket for a handkerchief. Instead, caught between my fingers, was the small, round firmness of the jade peony. In my mind's eye, I saw Grandmama smile and heard softly, the pink center beats like a beautiful cramped heart.